everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Increasing Your Online Presence. This is the third session in our Reignite Your Business series. So as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be sent to you via email, as well as added to our YouTube channel. So if you missed the last two sessions and you wanna watch those recordings, they are also available on our YouTube channel. Just head over to youtube.com and search MHVFCU. So please take a look at your toolbar that's on your screen. It's either on the right-hand side or maybe towards the top if you're on an iPad. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those in using the questions box that's on this toolbar. While we won't be stopping during the presentation to answer your questions immediately, we will leave time at the end of the session to go over all of those questions that are submitted. We do ask that you please be as detailed as possible when you're typing in those questions so that we know which part of the presentation you are referring to. We will also be using the polling feature during today's webinar. So we ask that you please respond to those poll questions as quickly as possible so that we have enough time to review your uh, responses and share those with everybody. And we're able to move on and cover the rest of the content in the webinar. So we have a lot to go over today. So I would like to take a moment to introduce our presenters to you. So my name is Sarah Short and I am the Financial Education Specialist here at Mid-Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union. And today I am excited to be joined by Caroline Falk and Taylor Richardson. So Caroline has been the Marketing Specialist here at MHV FCU since 2016. She received her bachelor's degree in Marketing and Accounting from SUNY New Paltz and is currently pursuing her MBA at Marist College. Caroline is a graduate of Leadership Duchess and is actively involved with Hudson Valley Young Professionals. At MHV, she manages the credit union's website, email marketing automation platform, digital marketing and other advertising channels and marketing campaigns. Taylor Richardson with EMS Consulting has been a digital marketer for the past 10 years and brings expertise in all things Google search engine, website and organic strategy, paid search engine, marketing advertising and analytics. She's based out of Austin, Texas, so she apologizes in advance if she lets a y'all or two slip during the presentation. So thank you, ladies, for being here with us today. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yes, thanks for having me. All right. So I'm going to kick it off now. Um, here's a quick agenda of what we'll be covering. We're going over a few different areas to help increase your online presence to appeal to Google and your customers. First, we're going to look at how to audit your website, get a general idea of improvements you can make. Next, Taylor's going to talk about what appeals to Google, what matters most to Google, so you can update your website to match this. Then we're going to go over Google My Business, why it's important to keep your listings updated and how to do it. Lastly, we'll go over reviews, how to develop a review strategy, start getting them to help with your Google online, Google ranking and online presence. So we're going to jump right in and start with a poll. So when was the last time you made a significant update to your website? I'm not talking about changing the hours because of COVID. I'm talking about the actual meat of your website. Was it last week, six months ago, a year ago, or maybe over a year ago? So use a little toolbar on the side and select your answers. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, any last minute responses? All right, I'm gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share the results. All right, so, 68% said last week, we had no one for six months, we had a few for over a year ago, and none for over three years ago. So that's pretty good. I'm glad a lot of you are updating your website as of recently last week. All right, so let's talk about the last time you've updated your website. Think about what has happened for your business since you've updated your website. COVID happened. Uh, maybe there was a new product or enhanced listing, industry-related updates. Think about what not touching your website means to Google. Taylor will get into this in a little bit, but maybe that their information is not accurate or not important. So think about why would Google rank you higher in the search engine results page, and why would they want to send traffic your way if you haven't touched it in a long time? We're past the times of setting it and forgetting it. We can't just redesign a website with nice new copy and nice new graphics and not touch it for three to four years. We need to constantly be making updates for the good of the customers to be accurate and also adjust to their habits and user experience, but also to stay relevant with Google so you can increase that online presence. 
more reasons to audit your website, you want to create a seamless user experience. If you're not touching your site in six months or so, you could be losing out on business. You need to constantly be updating it, creating a user experience that is easy to find information and keeping it very much updated and relevant. The last thing you want is a customer to be searching all over your site to find out how to place an order or what spec that product is. Next, you want to make sure that flow of your pages and your website are designed to co convert customers. We can't just throw information out on a page and expect it to convert a customer. You want to move them through the sales funnel, nurturing them, answering their questions before you throw in that call to action at them. Keep your call to action at the very minimum of one to three and think about what the ultimate goal is that you want them to do. Maybe it's a lead form and you want to set up some conversion tracking with Google and so you can track performance. What's worse than not finding information you want is having a slow site that won't load. Work towards having a fast site. You can Google what's my site speed, see what your desktop and mobile sites are performing at, and then try to fix it. A easy fix could be ensuring your images are compressed, meaning that they're small in size. And then also, almost as worse as not finding the information you want and having a slow site speed is not having a mobile-friendly site. Almost everyone has a phone at them, with them at all times, so why wouldn't we want to remove another friction point? We want to make sure that those pages are mobile friendly. Lastly, auditing your website can provide some insight to your customers' needs and wants. Wouldn't you want to know if a specific page is bringing in all your website's traffic? But what if this page has info on it that you thought that customers weren't attracted to? But if all, their, all your website traffic is going to this page, that's going to provide some really great insight. Okay, so here are some more questions to ask yourself when you're auditing your website. Are all the main value propositions of your website easily accessible? Do you have an intuitive website design and layout? There's not too many calls to actions, not littered with ads. It's not too cluttered. Do you have a shopping cart that's um, very modern? There's not a ton of distractions along the way that's adding friction points. And again, is your site speed good, mobile responsive, and make sure there's no misspelling, bad links, or grammatically incorrect sentences. Okay, so we're gonna do another poll here, and we're gonna see who uses Google Analytics. All right, so yes, I'm in it all the time. Yes, I use it somewhat. No, not at all, or what is Google Analytics? That's fine, if you don't know it, we'll get into that in a second. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds here and click what you guys use. All right. Any last minute votes in here? All right. I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share. So yes, a majority of you guys use it somewhat and some don't know what it is. All right. So let's talk about Google Analytics. Do you know the importance of updating and auditing your website? So now you need to go Google Analytics. So if you don't have one or, and you're not familiar with it, Google Analytics has great training on the platform and it will walk you through how to set up goals and tell you what to look at. But we're gonna talk about three areas that is recommended for you guys to start auditing your website. First, you're gonna look for pages with high traffic. Look at your high traffic in the past three months, six months, the past month, and you can find this under the behavior tab. Make sure that these pages with a high traffic are in tip-top shape. These are where your customers are going. So what improvements can you make here? Is the content accurate? Next, the same area under the behavior tab, we're gonna look at the high bounce rate pages in the past month, three months, six months. Again, high bounce rate means that they're leaving your site. They're not going from one page to another on your site, they're leaving. So what could be some reasons that they're leaving your site? What improvements can you make on this page? We talk about nurturing the customer, answering their questions, having a clear call to action. So those are some great starting points to make sure that you're following. Once you make some of these updates, continue to monitor the pages for the bounce rate to make sure that you're improving that bounce rate. Lastly, take a look at how you're acquiring your customers. If you, you can find this under the acquisition tab, Maybe it's all social traffic, or maybe it's organic, or referral, or direct. Look at how you're acquiring customers so you can understand them and understand the mindset they're in. If all your traffic is coming from ads, maybe you want to tailor your pages to be more towards the purchase phase of a sales funnel. Because if someone's clicking on an ad, 
they're further along, they've done their research and everything. So you wanna tailor the content for that. But if the majority is coming from organic, you wanna make sure you have more education, awareness, and you're nurturing them. Um, another great thing is to set up some user testing. User testing helps fill the gap between you and the customer. The lingo you may use may not be how the customer refers to something, or something that seems easy and straightforward may not be the case to the customer. So you want to identify pages that are most important or need improvement. Use the feedback to better understand them. How do they move through the sales funnel on your website? And then start making some improvements. You can gain a lot of insight by having users test your site or maybe in just specific pages. And two ways you can accomplish this are listed here. So maybe you want to ask some customers that come into your store often and then give them a gift card in exchange for asking them to do some simple task, like um, maybe tell them to find X, Y, Z and see how they get there and let them tell you how they get there. Or there's paid sites like Try My UI that will find testers walk you through the process of sending up questions and tasks, and then you just wait for the responses to come in, and at your own time, you can read through the responses and watch the videos. So before I turn over to Taylor for a little bit, here's some things I want you guys to remember. We can't set it and forget it. Most of you guys are making updates weekly, which is great, but there are some that weren't doing that as frequently. We want to keep the user front and center. Make that process seamless and easy. Be checking your Google Analytics account regularly and then start trying to test some of your pages and gain a lot of those insights. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Taylor and she's gonna talk all things Google. Thanks, Caroline. Great. Um, so, um, great introduction here, Caroline. So I think I think what we have really um, made very clear is obviously the website plays an important role in um, generating revenue for your business. Um, what I want to do for a second is kind of take a step back and um, pull ourselves a little bit out of our headspace as business owners and actually put ourselves in the headspace of a consumer um, because I think um, what is important to remember about Google is that Google their main function as a search engine, I mean, Google is many, many things right now, right? They have cloud services, they, um, they have significantly grown over time. So for purposes of today, we are focusing only on Google as the search engine, really. Um, and Google's job as a search engine is to organize the internet for consumers. Um, they are a business venture, they sell advertising. Um, what's interesting though is they have a significant balance between the revenue that they generate for advertising versus the weight that they give in their search engines for organic listings, right? So Google is constantly walking this balance between how much prominence do they give their paid ads versus how much prominence do they give um, their organic uh, listings for the rest of the internet. Um, and then of course there's always those um, algorithm updates that we hear about. Um, if, if you have your ear to the ground on uh, Google's search engine algorithm updates, uh, you might get updates and hear things like, um, you'll, you'll hear them called like panda updates or penguin and things like that. Um, really what I think is important about those updates is to know that Google is constantly, constantly tweaking its algorithms to give more precedence or less precedence to certain types of search results. Um, lately, it's been all about news, um, but also within the past few years, Google has given a lot more precedence to local searches, which I think spells a lot of um, good news for us as business owners, as local business owners. That means that um, when a local person in the Hudson Valley area is looking for something that me as a restaurant owner or as a boutique owner has to offer, um, I actually now have a fighting chance against other national retailers like the JC Pennies or the Chili's and Applebee's um, of the areas, right? Those national chains uh, who would normally dominate those search results. Um, Google has done a lot to uh, kind of level out the playing field a bit and give us local business owners a fighting chance. However, that does mean that we have a little bit of a responsibility um, as business owners to make sure that our website is as crawlable and rankable and indexable by Google as possible. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and take a look 
um, at what we mean when we uh, say that we want our website to be crawlable and indexable. So by before we dive into the specifics of what you need to do on your website, let's take a look at the anatomy of search engine results page, pages here. So um, as Google users ourselves, you've probably noticed over the years uh, that the top of the search results here is paid. Um, that entire area up there is paid. It used to be three listings and now it's four. Um, again, this is Google testing how much they can uh, rearrange that real estate and generate more revenue for themselves, of course. They have to keep the lights on too. Um, but that entire area up here is all paid. And um, anytime that somebody searches for what Google considers to be a commercial keyword or a transactional keyword, uh, that's going to trigger some ads in this area. These ads in this top area are always above the organic search results. Uh, you do have to scroll a little bit down in order to get to the organic section there. Um, I will also say that only four to six percent of users click in this area when they are doing brand agnostic searches. So if I'm looking for landscape companies in Austin, Texas, if I'm a, digital, a digitally savvy user, a consumer, I'm going to notice, okay, these guys are advertising, but I'm going to keep scrolling and probably look around in the organic section if I'm looking to evaluate somebody, um, a company, based on its merit and what other consumers think about them. Um, if I'm looking for a deal, like a coupon, I might click on an ad because I'm going to assume that the business is putting that kind of stuff out there. So just giving you a little bit of a sneak peek into how to think like a consumer, who is going through Google search results there. So there is a, a very real strategy there for doing paid ads, but because only four to six percent of users on any given SERP results page um, is gonna be clicking there, obviously that puts a huge amount of pressure on us, again, to really get our organic, um, the organic side of our website really uh, put together, right? Um, if you do keep scrolling down on the search results page, the search results pages, you will see that there is a chunk of paid ads at the bottom of every search page too. Um, I think the percentage of users that click down there is maybe less than one percent, um, so it's not really um, super useful. We're not going to talk a lot about that today. But if we want to go on to the next, um, there is a number of uh, there's a number of different SERP features that we're going to get into in a second. Um, but I, I know that um, many of us, when we're searching, especially uh, like local landscaping places, I'm going to use Austin as an example because that's where I'm located. Um, but anytime Google picks up on a local search they, that contains things like Austin, Texas or Hudson Valley or near me is also um, a local search phrase, uh, that's going to trigger local packs and that's going to give uh, Google the chance to give the user who maybe has location services activated on their phone. It's going to give them a way to get directions to your business. It's going to give them a way to see your business hours. Caroline's actually going to talk a little bit here in, um, after this section on your Google My Business listings and why it's so important to keep this information updated. As you can see here, Google relies on it to be able to get people to your front door if, um, if that is what your goal is. Um, if you are an online company, obviously, if you're doing your retailing online, um, having a link to your website is going to be incredibly important. So having a balance between updating your website and also your Google My Business listing is extremely, extremely important. Next slide, please. Other ways that you can opt, uh, optimize your website, um, if you are, let's say, in the landscaping business, um, you might be thinking, sure, I need to have some uh, product pages that talk about the landscaping services that I offer, right? Um, or if I'm a restaurant, maybe I need to have all of my menus, right, organized in some form or fashion. All of that is very true. But I want you to also think about um, a little bit outside of your immediate offerings and recognize that Google, in its effort to organize the internet, is, do, is looking for a lot more than just words and products to sell people. Uh, they're looking for answers to questions, right? Like in the landscaping results here. Um, which grass seed is best? If I'm, a, if I'm a homeowner in the Austin, Texas area, and I'm dealing with brown patches in my yard, I'm not gonna Google landscaping companies. I'm maybe gonna try to do it myself first, right? So I might do some research around grass and seeing if I can do it myself. However, if I start to notice that the same awesome landscaping company keeps giving me great answers and great information, 
and also they're, they're, they're answering my questions, they're informing me, um, and they're giving me um, a 10% off offer on my first order of grass seeds from them alongside that article, well, heck, that, that saves me as a consumer a lot of time. I'm gonna probably end my research at that point and just go ahead and buy this, this nice person's grass that they're gonna sell me because you know what, they've earned my trust. They've been answering my questions this whole time that I've been researching. So that's a sneak peek at how content starts to play a role in a consumer's research process and can really start to, um, to actually generate indirect revenue, right? Um, this also feeds the beast that is Google. If you're giving them answers to questions that people are asking all over Google, sure, not all of those people are gonna be your consumers and your buyers, but Google sure is gonna start to really love your website if you are consistently answering um, questions that, are, that people are asking Google, right? So it's, it's thinking about the role that your website plays in Google's large scale effort to try to organize the internet and answer people's questions. So if you wanna keep going, um, we can actually click through the next few slides here. There's um, videos, obviously Google loves to show up videos. So if your business is the type that it makes sense even to do a, just a couple minute video, they don't have to be overly produced like this Home Depot one. Um, you can see here that um, there's, there's some television shows being brought in here, but just know that um, Google is absolutely thirsty for locally produced videos on your iPhone. It doesn't, or your Android, it doesn't have to be um, very expensively produced, but um, having videos and optimizing your listings with uh, the answers to the questions that people are actually asking about your line of work um, is how you get your, your videos to, to show up alongside Home Depot's. Um, you can also optimize your listings. Uh, you can put video transcripts in the actual YouTube listing, and that is going to help the search engine actually recognize what the video topic is about. Um, if you ever want to see uh, how um, Home Depot is dominating the rankings, not just because they're Home Depot, it's because they have a giant marketing team of people who are tasked with things like transcribing the video text and putting the text into the video listing. You as a business owner, you know what you said in that video. That, that maybe takes you an extra 30 minutes while you're drinking your morning coffee. So um, you could do that to your video listing too. Get that up on YouTube and, um, and start garnering some traffic that way as well. So next slide. So there's others. Um, we're gonna click through the next couple if you don't mind. Um, any imagery that you put on your website um, becomes eligible for Google to rank. So again, um, thinking about your business line, depending on what you um, offer. Let's pause here, actually. Um, this is uh, where we start to get into organic results here. So um, we just talked about images. Um, uh, images are not a huge revenue generator unless you are a professional services like graphics design company and you're selling images online. Um, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about, about, a lot about those. But I did wanna pause here because I know as local business owners, we fight a lot uh, for local organic real estate with Angie's List and maybe house.com or Thumbtack, especially if we're in professional services. Um, if we're a restaurant, we might be fighting with those menu aggregator companies that wanna charge us a fee to get our stuff listed with them. So I wanna pause real quick and talk about those because unfortunately uh, they have had a leg up on us for a while. They've been playing the SEO game for a very long time. So sometimes it might make sense, depending on the price, as long as they're not unreasonable, it might make sense to actually suck it up and do a listing with them uh, because th th Etsy is doing the same thing to the creative space and to creative artists also. Um, there's the, the overhead fee that Etsy charges and you know, as a, an artist or a, an entrepreneur, I could say you, you do get benefit out of all of that work that they have done just make sure that um, you are getting what you pay for, right? So if you get an Angie's List listing, um, or if you pay for an Etsy uh, shop, or if you decide to go with Thumbtack, um, you know, understand their pricing models, understand how they're making their money, but also understand that you have a responsibility too to make sure that your page or your shop front with them is, al is also optimized so that you can really take advantage of all of this real estate here, right? So because Thumbtack is gonna be trying to rank for generic searches like best landscaping company, um, you wanna do your best to also fight for that keyword knowing that if Thumbtack is ranking for that keyword, that you have a chance of ranking within Thumbtack 
for being the best landscaper in your area. So you do still have to fight a fight. You can't just put up a storefront and expect them to do all the work. That's not how it works. Um, you also still have to do the work. You're just basically paying for um, you know, some of that page one real estate and then hoping that somebody has had good experience with Thumbtack before, for instance, they might click there and, um, and find you there. So that's the strategy there. Um, you don't wanna completely avoid them, but you also don't just wanna like give them all your money um, and expect that they'll do all the work uh, themselves either. Um, you will be able to rank here after you do a lot of um, hard work along for a long time and making sure that your, your website has high quality on page content, making sure that your, your uh, meta descriptions and your page titles are in tip top shape and making sure that they're optimized for your keywords for the services that you offer. So once you do that for a long enough time and you keep doing it well, you will eventually be ranking right alongside in this example of landscaping, the Home Depots, the Thumbtacks, and so forth and so on. Um, it's, it's, I, I use the metaphor a lot of uh, the best time to plant a tree was actually 20 years ago. Um, that doesn't do a lot for us now. So the next best time to plant a tree is now. And that's kind of how organic works as well. So for those of you um, who, uh, who made changes, significant updates to your website in the last week, good job, keep going. For those who did it a year ago, totally great. At least you did it a year ago. I'm, that's really, really good. Um, it, it now is probably a good time to go ahead and start evaluating uh, what new fresh content can we start adding to the website? How can we adjust our homepage, especially in our product pages and offerings to talk about the, the very real concerns that consumers are faced with now? Um, Google notices when you make those updates. It's a signal to them that you're paying attention and um, that you care about your content. And so making those little updates, um, even if they're little, can make a difference. You wanna go to the next slide? Um, yeah, so um, a little bit about improving your organic visibility in those other SERP features, making sure um, that you verify your business through Google My Business. Again, Caroline's going to get into the details and how to actually um, manage those listings and the strategies behind that. Uh, you want to make sure that you are um, that you have your Facebook page claimed, that it's accurate and that you're keeping up with it. You want to make sure to respond to your messages in a timely fashion. You wanna make sure that all of your business info stays up to date. Um, last but not least, you wanna make sure that you have a public site map of your website um, located at your domain backslash sitemap.xml. So I know a lot of folks right here are probably thinking, oh gosh, how do I do that? There's a huge chance that if you are using a plugin-based content management system like WordPress or Squarespace or Wix, um, a lot of those have plugins or have functionality inherently built in that actually put up a sitemap for you. Um, if you're curious about that, do a, do, you can load a help desk ticket probably with them if you have support access with them. Um, you could also just try going to your website backslash sitemap.xml uh, to see if, if a sitemap shows up, then you are good to go. If it doesn't show up, um, then you might want to get on with support and do a little bit of Googling yourself to see if your particular plugin or theme or CMS is what we call those content management systems um, that your website is built on. You want to see how they handle the sitemap there. So put that on your to-do list for sure. Just do a little reconnaissance work and see, do you have a sitemap or not? And if not, how do you get one? Um, if you have a WordPress site, I can speak from personal experience that Rank Math is a free SEO plugin that will put up a sitemap for you. All right, next slide. Again, so this is a little bit about those uh, content management systems here. Again, you'll get a copy of this uh, web of this PowerPoint, um, so you'll be able to to really pour back through this. Um, beware that that overburdening your um, CMS with a bunch of plugins can cause the site to be slow. So just as Caroline was mentioning, we want to always keep an eye out on that. If you have any plugins that you're not using, get rid of them. Uh, you can uninstall them through WordPress or through Squarespace uh, or whichever CMS you're using. Um, you also want to look out for over customization um, because you want to be able to update your CMS whenever updates come through. Um, and again, really recommend if you don't have a sitemap or uh, an ability to put meta descriptions on each of your page, um, then you really want to look into getting a basic SEO plugin um, that will allow you to just, it, it, a lot of them do the work for you and set those things up and they'll just give you a box where you can type in your meta description. 
um, and they'll just automatically put your sitemap up for you. They'll automatically set up this robots.txt file, which is just another housekeeping item for Google. Um, but again, it's, it's important SEO features that are signals to Google that you're internet savvy and you're paying attention. And again, it's all in that effort of helping your site be as crawlable and indexable by Google as possible. Next slide. <clears throat> Great. Okay, so a big principle, um, so once you get the technical stuff out of the way, which is what we've really been talking about so far, and I know a lot of that is either very boring or very terrifying, but it, trust me, um, if you get those plugins, you'll be good to go. You'll, you'll get used to it over time. Um, the other side of the coin on organic is making sure that your content is organized um, and not just organized in a, in a way that makes sense, the way that we would organize our closet, um, but actually organized by the search phrases that people, that actual consumers are using to find your products and services. So um, in the example of a retail establishment, um, we would wanna make sure that current products are listed here, right? So I'm just gonna to say for a bit, I'm using all local retailers uh, to Austin, Texas. That way I'm not accidentally picking on anybody in the Hudson Valley area. But I can tell you, uh, Lilla and Beth is a local boutique um, I think they only have two locations. One of them is around the corner from me. Um, as soon as COVID happened, they switched to an online ordering and, and in-store pickup format. So they went from being just a brick and mortar storefront with a basic website with their store hours and um, you know just a little bit about them and maybe a blog to full on having their products insert. Like they went full e-commerce. Even though they are not normally an e-commerce site, they still recognize that during COVID times, people are using Google to get answers to things for businesses that are around the corner. It used to be we could just jump out and walk to the, to the to that store and ask or pick up the phone and call and there was a person sitting there that would answer. It's different now. People want to go on Google, um, even for stuff that's right around the corner from them. So that does put a little bit of pressure on us as local business owners to, again, start really looking at and evaluating how do we act more like an e-commerce site? <clears throat> um, I wanna also mention before we go to the next slide that investing in a good search bar, so again, evaluating, testing out your search bar on your site. See if you type in um, you know, uh, 4th of July dresses, for instance. Do, what, what do your search results look like? Um, if, if you hate them, that's okay. That doesn't mean, oh, it's a crisis situation. It just means, you know, put it on your to-do list for when you get yourself a new website, because uh, we, we do need to get new websites every so often, that you're gonna want one with a powerful uh, search bar to be able to find um, products and services. So again, a lot of this research can just be looking at our current website today, evaluating it under today's new standards and um, making a to-do list of what we want in our new website. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, so again, um, I'm gonna go quickly through these. So organizing the website content by search phrase. So if you're a professional services provider, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that all of your uh, offerings each have their own page dedicated to that product and service so that each page has a fighting chance of ranking for that. So if you do commercial landscaping, you need a commercial landscaping page, just like you need a regular uh, consumer real estate landscaping, regular design page and installation, right? All right, next slide. Um, this is an example of how you might organize your website from a, uh, an architecture standpoint, right? So this might also reflect how your drop-down menu looks. They don't necessarily have to be the same, but essentially underneath your homepage here, you want to dedicate at least a, a section of your website to your product listings and have each of your individual products on their own page stemming off of that full product listing page. Um, the point here is that we want the domain of authority coming from our homepage trickling all the way down to our products and services pages. Those are the ones that bring in the money. So uh, we need to make sure that they are crawlable by Google. All of these other pages though, about us, contact us, any articles or content that we might uh, write, for instance, about the best grass seed or the best, uh, the, the best trends for 4th of July this year. Um, you know, that uh, might be in the article section of our site. So this is just an example of how you would organize it from a URL perspective. Next slide. Um, so if you're a restaurant, um, think about how your consumers um, are probably Googling for uh, your, your 
your food types, right? So uh, you can take a bunch of different strategies in this in this example here. Um, so uh, real quick, I want to call out, there are some cheap plugins out there. I think what I run into the most as a restaurant consumer myself is that uh, there's those third-party website uh, or menu aggregators. They're the menu online ordering services. And what's good about them is that they enable you to have online ordering. Um, what's bad about them is that in a lot of cases, some restaurant owners uh, go with those third-party online ordering platforms, but they don't take the time to also hard code their menu on their actual website. So you have to understand that those third-party menu um, online ordering platforms, they, the consumer's probably jumping off to a different domain when they actually place the order, right? That's what you sort of paid for is that infrastructure and the ability for them to do that order. So what you want to do is make sure that your actual domain, your website, so let's say you are Paco's Tacos, um, which is a taco place around the corner from me. If I were Paco's Tacos uh, business owner, I would make sure that my pacostacos.com website has all of my tacos listed and all the ingredients and all of the side items and all my desserts and all my drinks. All of that would be hard coded on my website in addition to having a link um, that somebody can click off to to go order online. And then they can go off to that third party site, they can do their order. That menu matches my menu, everything's hunky dory. Um, but you want to make sure that your website um, it has your menu so that you are ranking for it and not this third-party website that you're paying money to. Next slide. So again, this is about that uh, that menu here. So this is what when Google recognizes that you have your menu online, they are going to um, put it here. So I've made a note here. Um, in this particular case, Veracruz All Natural, even though they're delicious, it was impossible for me to browse. Uh, their menu without starting an online order. So that's again another just consumer experience uh, thing that um, that comes from not having your menu hard coded on your website. Next slide. And this is an example here. Um, if I click to Colleen's Kitchen, again, fully local. They only have one location. They are around the corner from me. So if they can do it, I do believe that um, anyone can do it. This one went straight to their menu, colleenskitchen.com slash menu. I was able to browse. I was able to see their daily specials. Okay, it's Thursday. Cool. That's fried chicken night. I probably am going to do that. So um, I didn't have to initiate an online order and fight with that third-party system in order to get my questions answered. Next slide. Um, the other benefit that this has from an online ordering, or not just an online ordering standpoint, but um, I want to point out that, um, again, Google leveled the playing field with our, our local searches. Because Colleen's Kitchen is doing everything right, they have their menu online, Google knows what they offer. I want you to see this search here, fried chicken near me. This is a local search um, specifically for the type of food that happens to be on their menu. You can see here, they do not identify as a fried chicken establishment, yet they are outranking Church's and Lucy's fried chicken. That is the power of putting your offerings on your website and taking the time to make sure it's coded correctly. I know that was a very long-winded adventure there. I'm glad you stuck it out with me there. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you that even the little guys, that's us local business owners, we can fight it and duke it out against the churches, the Home Depots, the Applebee's um, for our offerings. Next slide. Um, this here is a little example of the multi, the, the different ways that you can organize your menus. Um, really, I think the key comes down to identifying your consumers and what they're searching for. So if you have, um, if you have like a family restaurant and your main, let's say you have a menu that has a lot of uh, variety on it, and let's say you've got it divided by lunch and dinner. That's a great way of organizing it online. You are going to um, do really well in searches like dinner restaurants near me or lunch near me or um, you know all day breakfast near me. Those are gonna be searches that you would want to make sure you have pages for. Next slide. However, if you are a taco establishment and tacos, enchiladas, maybe Tex-Mex in, in the case of Austin, Texas or barbecue in Texas, let's say that's your thing. You might want to skip the whole lunch or dinner um, organization idea, and you might want to skip straight to the type of food that you offer. Similarly to the fried chicken deal, even though Colleen's Kitchen doesn't identify as a fried chicken place, um, they actually organize theirs by lunch and dinner. Um, as long as you have your dishes hard-coded, hard your actual plates on your menu website, 
then um, you will be able to uh, also have a fighting chance in ranking for these types of searches like tacos near me or fried chicken near me or barbecue near me. Next slide. And so if you wanna go even simpler, this is actually how Colleen's Kitchen does it. This proves that you don't need a complicated uh, website structure. You can have your menu and have every single category of your menu all on one page. Just make sure that you are getting your header tags right so that Google can, can organize it. Next slide. This is what I mean by header tags. Again, you're gonna to wanna to spend more time on this after the presentation and really look at what these H4, H3, these H2, H1s, um, really the, the takeaway here is that each page needs one H1. Uh, they can have as many H2s, H3s, H4s, and H5s as, as you want after that. But um, think about it like when you were back in, when we were all back in school and we had to do um, essays and stuff like that, we had to uh, create this hierarchy with our headings. That's exactly how header tags work. Um, they help Google better understand what the page is about and how stuff is organized. So take the time to actually create that hierarchy and on your content, on your pages. Um, here's a, a menu example here. You can see every single plate is in a header tag in this example. This is Taco Cabana. Um, on, the, on the retail front, We've got the page H1 tag is dresses, and now we have all of the different names of dresses. Next slide. So ensuring your meta and titles are unique across all of your pages. Um, everything that we just said before, you wanna make sure that um, when you're organizing your content, you're not creating three pages that are all called dresses. You want all of your dresses on one page. Same thing, you don't want three different pages called menu. You want one menu divided up into logical uh, sections here. Um, your meta descriptions are important because they match uh, the keyword phrase that somebody is typing in. Google's gonna bold those keywords. Google is also gonna display your meta description here in gray, so it kind of is the first impression somebody gets when they are evaluating your page. Next slide. Um, URL structure uh, should be human readable and should reflect what is actually on the page. Um, you want to make sure that your SEO plugin is going to properly 301 redirect um, any pages that you are trying to delete. Um, this is again, just let your plugin take care of this. This is a technical thing. Um, it's the importance again of having a plugin though. Next slide. And then last but not least, this is the role back what we were saying before about those SERP features. So it, once you've done all the heavy work and hard coding your menu and your offerings, um, you can also go back through and do alt tags on your images. So um, now I'm not gonna say that this image of a burrito is probably not making Taco Cabana a ton of money. So, you know, I don't think I would recommend doing this first, but when you're run out of things to do and you're really trying to rank for as many searches as possible, this is the role that, um, that image alt tags play. It also helps with screen readers. So if somebody is using a screen reader to read the website, um, they'll be able to know that this is a picture of a burrito. Um, and that actually helps us from a, uh, an accessibility standpoint. Very nice. And so those, I know that's a lot. Um, I, my expectation there is that you'll be able to uh, chew on these slides a lot more um, and use them to work through and make improvements to your website. But as long as you follow the goal of, of making your products and services um, as visible and organized and crawlable on your website as possible, um, then you are um, well on your way to being more Google accessible. And then back to you, Caroline. Awesome, thanks, Taylor. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Google My Business listing and reviews. We're gonna start off with another poll. Um, we're gonna see who uses Google My Business already. All right, so I'm gonna launch the poll. Yes, you have it set up but haven't used it. Yes, you have it set up and you update it off often. No, you don't use it or you don't know what Google My Business is, but we'll get into that. So take a couple seconds and answer the poll on your toolbar. All right. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll and show the results. So it looks like most of you don't use it at all and there are some that have it set up but haven't used it. Both of those are fine. We're gonna go over um, all this right now. Okay, so why use Google My Business? So how many times during COVID have you searched for a service and wondered if those hours listed on Google were even correct? It's so important to have your name, address, 
phone number, the website URL, and hours always up to date with your Google My Business listings. Consider it losing business if you have this information out there and it's inaccurate. How much time will the consumer put in to search across the web to find this real information? And maybe they don't even want to go to your website to find this information. They want it right from Google. They want it easily accessible. And so that's why Google created Google My Business. I know it personally frustrates me when I can't call a business right from the Google listing or the website's not there for me to click. So this is exactly why we need to keep this information updated. So yeah, so number one, manage the information. You can easily add, update, and easily change things on the go. So you can interact with your customers. So you can do posts just like social media, and you can add pictures or offers. Plus, they have a messaging feature if you want to turn that on and create some interactions that way. You can also respond to reviews. And then the last part is why it's so important is that voice searches are using Google My Business information and the ratings to then deliver the results to your Alexa or your Google Home. Um, you can understand and expand your presence with their analytics. So you can see how many clicks, calls, bookings, directions, all the different ways the consumer engaged with your Google My Business listing. You can gain a lot of insight. And then lastly, it's free. So of course, why do I want to use it if it's free? So the only requirement is that you must have a face-to-face -face interaction with customers. So meaning you're not 100% online. So this is just an example. We've seen a lot with Taylor, um, what they kind of look like. So I'm just going to skip through this one. And then here, um, so if you don't have a Google My Business already, the green is where you're going to start. So you're going to go enter some basic information. Um, then you're going to go and verify your business. So you can do that with a postcard, email, phone. Um, you can even do bulk verification if you have multiple locations. Um, at MHV, we have multiple and we only have one phone number. So we had to go the postcard route and that sent it to each of our branches and then we verified that way. So you're gonna wanna pick the option that makes most sense to you. But once you're verified, you can continue building your profile and you wanna add as much information as you can. And we'll get into that in a real quick second. But I just wanna also note that they have an app. So you can make updates in the app, post statuses, see the insight, respond to reviews, get those notifications that a review came in. Um, you can do a lot. And of course, you want to do number four and five, periodically checking to make sure this information is accurate. All right, so once it's verified, you can add a lot in there. You can add a description, maybe your mission statement or offering. You can also add attributes. So maybe you have free Wi-Fi, takeout, you accept reservations. Um, you can add a profile picture. So Maybe it's your company's logo or a storefront if you have multiple locations. Um, you can do cover photos. So this is very important as this shows up front and center for your listing. So maybe your business has something identifiable or something cool to showcase. Maybe it display inside or an employee in front of the building. Um, think about what you want for your cover photo as that front and center piece. Um, you can also add additional photos. This is very much recommended. You can add exterior shots, interior shots. Google recommends a minimum of three exterior and three interior. You can also post photos of your product or menu items, employees working, different rooms inside your business, like a lounge, um, and even do a video. It's recommended 30 seconds or less of a video that's gonna add some value. Maybe you're walking through your store and showcasing what it looks like, with some music, or maybe it's employees working, or maybe you're just talking about your core values. Yeah, it's annoying to film video, but think about it from the customer's perspective. You're adding value and you're doing more than your competitors, which will make you stand out. Um, so these are just different posts. So I said they're, it's like social media. So you can post photos, messages, and offers for the public to see. So when someone's Googling for an Italian restaurant near me, They'll see your business info, like your hours and your website, but they'll also see your posts with your photos or maybe you have an offer for a family dinner package. This is another area to reach your customers and provide value. Businesses that post regularly with photos get 35% more clicks to their website and have 42% higher requests for driving directions. So think about it. When you're looking for an Italian restaurant again, 
Do you want to see what the outside of the building looks like so you can identify it while driving? Maybe you want to see some pictures of the food. So these are all different ways that you can utilize the post feature. There's a bunch of different ways you can get insight to see how engaged your customers are. If you already, already have a profile set up, it'll be good to see where you are right now and then make all these improvements and then see how much more you're um, increasing your performance. So you have clicks, the follows, the photo views, you can see a lot. Optimizing your profile will not only help your customer find you better, but it's gonna increase that online presence, gonna help with the Google ranking and ultimately help with revenue. So there's not just Google My Business, there's tons of other listing sites. Here are just some uh, logos of a few, but there's probably pages out there for your business and you don't even have um, a clue about it or you're not managing it. You need to make sure you're updating these sites with your accurate information. Um, you can go and ask Alexa or Google Home, ask them a simple question about your business and then see, did it deliver the right answer? And then the information may be right on Google My Business, but one of these different sites is pulling wrong information. And so Google's saying, Google, my, Google Home is saying a different answer. There's a lot and it can be a lot of work, but take it one day at a time, one platform at a time, or you can seek some paid help from Mod Local or SEMrush or Yes. Um, they can even help because people can suggest an edit and then that will change your answers. So that's why you want to always be checking on it. But these platforms, they have some technology that will help to lock those um, information that you enter in so people cannot suggest an edit. All right, we're gonna do another poll. I promise this is the last poll. Um, we're gonna ask about the review strategy. So who has a review strategy? Yes, no, or you somewhat do. So on the side, take a couple seconds and answer the poll. All right, looks like most of the responses came in. I'm going to close it and share it. So most of you said you somewhat do, and some said you don't, and no one said quite a definite guess. So let's talk about reviews. All right, I'm going to share some stats here. They're very powerful. So 86% of people will hesitate to use a business that has negative online reviews. 90% of consumers will read online reviews before visiting a business. Another 90% of customers said that their buying decisions are influenced by online reviews. 88% of consumers trust online reviews as much as a personal recommendation. And then lastly, 85% of consumers don't trust reviews that are more than three months old. A bit shocking, right? But all this is true. Think about yourself. I know I read reviews before trying a new restaurant or a hair salon. Um, people are definitely using reviews and using that to weigh their decision. So why does it matter besides all those stats we just went over? It, one, it helps customers with purchasing decisions, and two, improve your Google organic ranking. Again, you're looking for an Italian restaurant, what do you do? You go to Google, then what? You look at the reviews, maybe you go to Yelp, maybe you go to Facebook, but you look at Google and you see maybe a bad review. I wouldn't even start reading the reviews if it was less than a three-star rating. I'll take a look at the highest rating restaurant first, start reading the most recent reviews. If there hasn't been any reviews in the past year, I would even move on to the next restaurant. Google takes into account the recent reviews and the good quality reviews when they're ranking your website on the search engine results page. But also even more important, customers wanna see high ratings and those recent reviews. To Google and even to the customer, having very few reviews and even reviews being over six months old, can be as bad as having no reviews. Even if you have a five-star rating, it's not enough to have 10 five-star reviews that are over a year old. So we need to continuously be asking and for reviews and staying current and fresh. So how often should you be getting reviews? It's recommended of one a month. That's not bad at all. And then if you get a negative review or if your score falls below a 4.0, you wanna start asking more for reviews, getting some more good ones in there because you don't want that one star review out there anyways um, for, the, for that person to see. So you wanna kind of cover it up a bit, but also increase your score. So one a month, and then if it's, you get a bad one or falls below, increase that goal. 
but how do you get reviews, right? So 68% of consumers will leave a review if asked. So we need to start asking. So you wanna ask after positive moments, like if they had success with your product or they made a purchase, or maybe they even referred a customer to you, that's a great moment. You wanna ask two to three times because people are busy or they forget, and then keep that within five to seven day time frame after that transaction's taken place. So no more than seven, because then it's old news. If you ask more than three, you're kind of hounding them. So this is the sweet spot here. These are some sample talking points for your employees to ask the customers. I'm just gonna skip right over this so you guys can come back later on and read through them. Here's some other gathering ideas. So if you have new employees, make it part of your onboarding process with them to discuss why reviews are important and how to ask for them. Maybe you're emailing with a customer, so you wanna email them back and say, hey, thanks for contacting us today. Can you leave us a review? You wanna highlight them on social media. Say, this, this location got a five-star review from so-and-so. Leave us a review too. This is great. This is awesome feedback. You can make handouts and put instructions on it because not everyone's familiar with leaving reviews, even on Google. And then even adding to your email signature is an easy place for people to see it when, if you're emailing back and forth. All right, so now you got reviews, then what? You need to respond to all positive and negative reviews in a timely manner. So you want to set up those email and those app alerts to get notified when a new one comes in. If they're positive, you want to thank them for their time because they took time out to leave you a review. So be sure to thank them. Acknowledge what they enjoyed and liked. Maybe suggest another product for next time. Be personal in your message. Don't just copy and paste the same thing you posted on another review. You're going to sound like a robot, and people are going to notice that if they're looking through all your reviews and you're posting the same thing back to people. Then be sure to share them with staff and maybe even tell tell them in your response in the positive review that you're going to share it with staff. People like to see that. If it's a negative review, it's important to address, address the negative reviews and show that you acknowledge it and try to resolve the concern. So make it a top priority to respond within a few hours or within a day. Don't be defensive. Even if you're not in the wrong, you're going to look bad to the public because that's public um, responses there. So apologize, acknowledge their concerns, and try to move it offline. So the last thing you want is to go back and forth with a consumer that's not happy. You may even get them to change your rating if you've resolved their issues offline. So that would be a great result. I've seen it time and time again. And of course, share with your staff for encouragement, acknowledgement. A lot of reviews still list, oh, so-and-so is so great at this branch location. They're the best. I always go to them. And if you share it with all your staff, they're going to want to start getting reviews that mention their name. So it's a, it had a little bit of competition, and that'll be great. So here is a review. It's quite long, but it's that not all reviews need to be this long to be impactful. But here, this is from MHV's Hurley Avenue branch, and he listed how long he's been a customer, what we do well, the staff he loves. He likes that we have a personal touch, and he said he was going to return. Then we responded, very personal, even with a hashtag, referred to his name, acknowledged and thanked him for what he said, and we said we would pass it on. So again, they don't all need to be this long, but this is just an example of a strong review that I'm sure if a potential customer saw, they'd be persuaded. And then here's some shorter ones, a five-star rating with no comment. We still responded, because people are going to see that. And then the five star just has a brief um, message there. And again, we responded. Um, here's a negative one. It's out there. We're not hiding it. It's public. So here we apologize and explained what we tried to do with every experience. And then we said we're going to send it back to our management and try to improve what we did. So before we wrap it up here, these are some things to remember. So reviews are important because it helps the customer with the purchasing decisions and it helps with Google. 68% consumers will be review if asked. So we've got to start asking. Ask two to three times within five to seven days and be sure to respond to all reviews in a timely manner. And don't forget to send it out to your staff for encouragement and acknowledgement. All right, so I hope this presentation provides some value to you guys. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for some Q&A.
Yes, thank you. If uh, anyone has any questions, please submit this, submit them at this time, and we'll go over those in just a moment. Please also mark your calendars to join us for our next and final session on developing a new marketing plan. That's next Thursday, July 9th at 11, and it's presented by Mary Claire Cranston, who is an MHV content specialist. So again, submit your questions if you have any right now. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, if everyone can please, as they're leaving today's webinar, submit uh, a survey. It'll pop up on your screen as soon as you close out of the webinar. We value your input and your feedback, and we use that to help us to continue to improve our webinars. So thank you to Caroline and Taylor once again for joining us today. Um, and that concludes today's webinar. So thank you once again, and have a fantastic day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.